Okay, so I'm going to basically briefly talk on epidemiology, then etiology, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. And most of my time will be uh, spent on treatment. I always ask this question, is heart failure more common in women or men? <laughs> That's funny. I, I really did this for humor, so actually I think I am, uh, I find that pretty funny. So actually every year it changes um, that based on the AHA guide, uh, the stats. And this year it happens to be that there are more men than women, 3.1. Usually it's actually equal or very close, so it is kind of funny. but. Um, yeah, this year there's more males than females. What's more important is to recognize that heart failure increases, the incidence increases with age. As you can see here, basically when you go from 20 years of age to 80, there's a large difference in the number of cases. Um, so the prevalence increases for both men and for women, and that's probably the most important take home message. Etiology is the next topic. Which is the most common risk factor Hypertension, coronary disease, valvular disease, diabetes, or alcohol? Excellent. Okay. So the first question was kind of silly. This actually is really <laughs> very important. This is the most common risk factor, high blood pressure. The second most common cause is coronary disease. So for those who uh, chose B, um, that is the second most common cause, and the others are, are um, less uh, common. So this is actually Framingham data, which shows that for both men and women, high blood pressure is the most common cause, okay? And this is borne out on, on many, many, many registries. Um, the other important thing to mention is the fact that coronary disease is the second, and although more males have coronary disease as the cause of heart failure than women, notice how many women have it. It's still the second most common cause of heart failure in women as well, okay? This is an important slide showing that there's a difference between prevalence of, and risk factors versus relative risk, okay? So, so many patients out there have high blood pressure that only a very small percentage of them really are at risk of developing heart failure, okay? As opposed to coronary disease, when you develop coronary disease, you're much more likely to actually develop heart failure. And it sort of makes sense, because you think about it, when you have a heart attack, you've permanently damaged your heart, okay? It's not gonna, no medicine really is gonna make that heart function, it will make it a little bit better, but the damage is, is much more permanent, okay? Diagnosis. How do you diagnose heart failure? By echo, by BMP levels, constellation of symptoms and signs, catheterization or none of the above. Excellent. Okay, we're going to touch on all of these, but uh, yeah, so it's really a constellation of symptoms and signs. Okay, so, you know, the most common complaint is shortness of breath, and as the patient progresses, um, they really uh, become much more symptomatic and require extra pillows to sleep on. Um, they um, can develop a nocturnal cough, um, they will have uh, fluid um, also sometimes in their abdomen or legs. It's usually one or the other. Sometimes you'll get both, but most people will begin to swell in one or the other. So when you examine them, they'll have JVD you should look for. You should also listen for rails, although most of the time patients, if it's chronic, will not even have that. When you do your cardiac exam, you try to decide whether the point of maximal impulse is actually in the proper place or is it displaced implying that it would be enlarged. Um, we always uh, assess whether the liver is enlarged and whether the spleen is enlarged, and also obviously look for leg edema. The guidelines kind of have changed. We have new heart failure classifications, so I think most of us refer to the Functional New York Heart Association 1 through 4. Is that what most of you use? Yeah. So we still use that. Um, a lot of our old studies are based on that, but we have a new staging system, A through D, and that actually is in order for us to try to prevent heart failure before we get to the symptomatic phases. So stage A is actually patients who are at high risk of developing heart failure but have no structural heart disease. 
So the you know, two most common causes would be high blood pressure and coronary disease. So those would be those patients. Stage B is somebody who actually has structural heart disease. Okay? They have something wrong with their heart, but they're asymptomatic. That kind of sounds like functional class one, right? That's exactly what that is. Stage C refers to all the stages of symptomatic heart failure, okay? And stage D is to remind us that they're this, they failed medical therapy. I always remember D for dead. You really are at the very end, and you have to choose advanced therapeutic options. I was going to go back to the, the things on the question about how to diagnose only because um, we do use the other testing uh, in order to kind of uh, manage the patients. So here, obviously, is a normal heart, very cartoon drawing. The second is actually with impaired systolic function, which we'll see that the wall is thin compared to here, and the cavity is bigger, okay? So you have a bigger baggy heart that uh, can't handle the uh, volume that it receives. In the patients that we used to refer to as diastolic, which we no longer use that term, we now call it preserved systolic function, they often will have thickened uh, myocardium, so the wall thickness is a little bit thicker than that, and the cavity size is smaller. So first, with their very thick walls, they can't actually relax properly, um, and so it can't fill properly, and so you basically have a small cavity and everything backs up. And then for people who use uh, BMP levels, that was another uh, question, that's really done as a screening. Um, it's not a requirement. In fact, it's not even a guideline recommended uh, therapy. It does have prognostic significance, um, and it has been used to try to distinguish between patients who have heart failure and other causes of shortness of breath, especially in the emergency room. But it is a screening test. It could be elevated in anything that causes the right side of the heart to um, be stressed by high pressures pretty much in the lung, okay, or high filling pressures on the right side. So it is a screening test. It does have survival. Um, it can prognostically uh, help define who's going to do well. And there is some evidence that women actually do um, worse with the same BMP levels uh, than men, and this was actually um, one study with survival. And being a, a specialist in women with heart failure, that's probably my only uh, heart failure in women's slide. Okay, prognosis. Is heart failure the most common medical diagnosis for hospitalized patients? So I was trying to remind myself why I put this in here, and it was really because for prognosis, the question is, you know, morbidity, mortality. And um, morbidity would be hospitalizations. And so what is the most common uh, diagnosis for a hospitalized patient? Okay, yeah. And that's why there's so much importance placed on heart failure, because it is the most common cause um, of, uh, of requiring treatment in a hospital for Medicare patients. So this shows, this slide shows that for, um, for many years, actually, the, uh, there was an increase in the number of hospitalizations for heart failure. Uh, for women, this appears to be going down, but for men, uh, this is uh, still on an upward rise. And this is, again, the latest stats provided. Do women or men with heart failure live longer? Excellent, so women do live longer. There are two registries that we use for basically a lot of our data in general. One is uh, the Framingham that I think most of you are familiar with, and the other is the Olmsted County, which is the Mayo's registry. And so both uh, registries have shown that women, survival's on this axis, and women have a better survival than men. Women have a better survival than men, no matter what decade you look at. Survival is so poor that many times oncologists will kind of, you know, comment that we really are very similar, that actually the prognosis is uh, pretty bad for both uh, cancer as well as for heart failure, though we hope to change that. Okay, so now we're back to treatment, and this is the most important part. So stage A, treatment is now based on the stages, okay? So for stage A, there are patients who are at risk but with no structural heart disease, 
and the guidelines recommend that we treat the underlying disease and we begin an ACE inhibitor or an ARB, okay? Risk factors include high blood pressure, atherosclerosis, diabetes, obesity, and the metabolic um, syndrome. Stage B, patients who have basically structural heart disease but no symptoms. This is your functional class one. Now you're gonna add a beta blocker to the regimen. So an ACE or an ARB plus a beta blocker, okay? In very select cases, you'll use ICDs. That's gonna be for patients with MIs. Um, so, you know, when we say structural heart disease, not only could there be an impairment of the systolic function, but we also include left ventricular hypertrophy as an impairment, um, as well as valvular disease. Stage C is what we usually think of when we think of heart failure, okay? These are the patients that are symptomatic with functional class two through four symptoms. Now, in addition to an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker, we use diuretics. We do not use diuretics if they're not symptomatic, okay? Diuretics are to make you feel better and get rid of fluid, okay? The only other drug that we have out there that helps you feel better that doesn't have a survival benefit is the digitalis, okay? Aldosterone antagonists are currently, the guidelines recommend it for class three and four, okay? That will probably change over time to include uh, the uh, lower classes, but because um, there's definitely research supporting that. But at the moment, the guidelines are class three and four. Hydralazine and nitrates are often used as substitutes when ACE inhibitors and ARBs are not you're not really able because either um, due to renal function or due to actually high potassium, but is actually the class of choice for patients that are African American that actually are, remain uh, symptomatic that um, basically are on good medical therapy. So then you add this to their regimen. Oh, and ICDs actually are really um, patients whose EF is less than 35%. Um, should be uh, considered for a prophylactic ICD. And currently the guidelines state that by V pacing, okay, CRT, um, is used actually for functional class three and four. Again, this is likely to change over time, but for those that are taking the test now, it will be class three and four. D for dead. If you don't do anything, that's where you're heading. So this is end stage. This is to remind us that we need to offer either hospice, transplant, palliative inotropes, mechanical hearts, or experimental drug therapy. This is, um, I have just a few slides on, on medications, not, not many. <laughs> I think one of the things that is my pet peeve is actually that I'll see somebody start Lasix and then add metolazone to, to basically get more urine out but they've just like put the patient on 40 of Lasix. Um, there are no guidelines on exactly what to do, but metolazone is a pretty strong drug, and basically the patient can get dehydrated pretty quickly, and they can also lose potassium rapidly. So I don't use um, metolazone until I've reached, you know, basically full dose of any of the loop diuretics. Um, I personally use Lasix because it's cheap, and so patients can afford it. And when I get to 100 milligrams BID, I switch them over to usually Demodex, which is the second highest strength. And then the most uh, potent is actually the Bumex. Um, and then you can use, commonly when we need a booster, we'll use metolazone. And the other thing that's been used is actually hydrochlorothiazide at, at about 50 milligrams usually will augment uh, the diuresis. Um, this is to remind us that spironolactone, the dosing is 12.5 to 25 milligrams. You can bump it to a maximum of 50, okay? But you have to really pay attention to the potassium. Um, and I think that's pretty much that. This is just to remind us that uh, what the maximum doses of therapy, because that's our targets. So for captopril, it's 50 milligrams three times a day. I'm not gonna do all of them, I'm only gonna do the most common. Enalapril, 20 milligrams twice a day, okay? Lisinopril is actually can go up to 40 once a day. Um, it's only $4 at Giant, so your patients usually prefer that drug. Ramopril is used in patients who've had heart attacks, 
and it goes up to a total of 10 milligrams per day. Candesartan, 32. Valsartan, 160. And I think y'all know that Coreg, um, most people will aim for a target of 25 milligrams twice daily. And uh, if your patient's morbidly obese, they need more. Um, with regards to Toprol, XL, we usually use, uh, we try to aim for a target dose of 200. Okay. Well, all those guidelines are actually for patients with impaired systolic function, so abnormal EFs. There really is very little to recommend for those that have normal LVEF, the preserved, the diastolic that we no longer, it's like bad to use the word, but we really don't have good guidelines. This is really the best we have. And basically it says, you know, you only care about the class ones, that you should treat the underlying disease. Um, specifically, since high blood pressure is the most common, you should treat high blood pressure. You AFib with rapid ventricular rate is another common cause. So you need to get the rate under control. And the last is really use diuretics as needed. And that's it. Thank you.